or WMU's Hayworth College of Business. I love data, uh, roller skating, and am the mother of two cats, Fiona and Sushi. Awesome. And Stephen, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephen. Uh, I work in digital and SEO support with Inverb. Um, I'm a graduate in, of Michigan State University. I'm a former member of the AmeriCorps. I love spending time with my dog Spanky and my niece Luna. And I used to be a kid swim instructor. Awesome. Uh, and I'm Jennifer Sleeper. I'm the marketing and sales manager. I have a background in media and advertising, also several years in PR and community engagement for some national restaurant brands. Um, and then a year off of college to work in the Highlands of Scotland digging worms on the Isle of Skye. So I have a pretty diverse work background, most of it related to media and advertising. Um, today's agenda, we're gonna talk first about just a little bit about what's changed um, with recent algorithms and how that's affected things. Then we're gonna get into SEO myths to look out for. And we're gonna talk about how search has evolved. Um, then we're going to talk about the actual optimizing. That's going to talk about the technical side of things, biggest ranking factors, content audits, pillar pages and topic clusters, what and how to optimize, and then a little touch on omnichannel expansion. Finally, we're going to get into some key takeaways and a Q&A session. So to kick things off, as a recap, we're going to talk just about SEO in general, which of course involves a lot of moving parts and important components, and they all work together. So from your website layout, navigation, link strategies to the quality, relevance, and amount of content, you have to make sure you're making it all work together. But we also know SEO is constantly evolving, which means the things you once knew might no longer be true. And that gets us into SEO myths. Today, we are going to call out some SEO practices that are no longer relevant, meaning these are SEO myths that we are going to bust today. So you know what strategies to avoid going forward if you want to evolve with current algorithms. So the way we search has changed a lot over the past decade and even the last few years. Search has transformed from a tool that provides quick answers to one that enables continuous exploration with recommendations tailor-made to our needs. Today's first myth is that we used to think you could use as many keywords as possible as many times as possible in order to rank. You can't overload your copy with keywords now, guys. The AI has outsmarted that very old school and annoying tactic. So this practice is increasingly flagged. It's been going on for over a decade, but people are still doing it. So it's really important to point out that this is a myth. You can't do this anymore. Things have changed. So this is a busted myth. We want to make sure that as we get into today, this is the first big factor to look at. We want to approach your content by writing for the reader. And we're going to look at some of these algorithms that have continued to make this change even more evident. So brief timeline, how Google's focus on the user experience has changed. We're going to go over briefly the rank brain update that really shifted things. And then a little bit into the medic update, the BERT update, and now we're into the 2021 page experience and core web vitals update that is rolled out this year, but it's still ongoing. So with that, I'm going to have Steven take over and talk just a little bit about some of these updates. Jennifer? So Google's rank brain algorithm allows you to search for synonyms and related words instead of just the exact word that you searched for. And it also places more importance on your intent rather than the keywords used. Before rank brain, search was rusty and much less intuitive than it is now. Your searches had to be much more specific to get the kind of information that you wanted. Since the introduction of rank brain, search has become much smoother and sleeker. It uses Google's algorithms to detect your intent to show you relevant and contextual results. This is a good example of how rank brain has changed search. Before rank brain, you were more likely to search vacation destinations and Google would show you a broad list of destinations. Now Google delivers intuitive results by pulling data on your search history, demonstrated interests, location, and other timely information. The next major update that we had was the 2018 Medic update. This brought about a new phase of quality standards for how Google ranks pages. It also introduced a higher focus on ranking sites based on expertise, authority, and trust. 
Another significant term that this update introduced was YM, YL, or your money or your life, which put more restrictions and quality control on pages offering personal information, especially health and wealth related. When Google BERT came out in 2019, it was called the biggest change to Google in the past five years. Um, BERT helped Google's AI focus on understanding more nuanced contextual and natural language in both queries and search results. And even though BERT was introduced in 2019, many marketers still haven't adapted it. Even fewer marketers have adapted to the significant updates since then, with the most recent being Core Web Vitals updates that have rolled out just this year. That's right. So if we know one thing about digital marketing, it's that you have to always be learning and adapting to new technology, new processes, and new algorithms from the platforms that control who appears in a SERP, right? So this brings us to our second myth that we're going to bust today. This myth is that content is the only factor that matters for ranking in a SERP. So too many people think that content is the only factor when in fact, what we're seeing with Core Web Vitals update, there's more and more shift to more of the technical side and the overall nuances that play a role in the user experience. So this myth is busted and we're gonna get a little bit more into that to show you why. So this year's latest rollout, which is still making continuous updates, even as recently as last week, focuses on three primary aspects, loading time, interactivity, and visual stability. And within that, there are more factors that basically contribute to what they're referring to as page experience signals. Most of these, again, are very technical. So we're going to talk more about what that means. But before we do, I do want to point out that HubSpot has a great tool. The HubSpot on-page SEO tool is amazing. It uses Google Lighthouse behind the scenes to scan your pages and flag any that have an unsatisfactory score for any of the main three core Web Vitals metrics. So Google plus HubSpot makes pretty happy users if you're using this tool. So what does it all mean for your overall strategy? It means Google's looking more than ever at the user experience. Their alg algorithms are getting smarter and smarter at detecting the best sites to give the users what they want. And you'll notice the latest core web vitals didn't mention anything about content specifically. So that means while content has been the primary focus and will continue to be a major focus, it's just that Google's telling us we have to pay attention to a lot of other factors. And a lot of them are about optimizing the technical side first. So many of the Google algorithms rely more and more on the foundation, and these are important factors. So we're going to get in a little bit talking about your website's overall health. I'm going to ask Olivia to help touch on some of these key technical components of your SEO strategy. So technical SEO or on-page SEO is the process of optimizing various front-end and back-end components of your website so that, so that it ranks in search engines and brings in new traffic. You'll want to check your technical setup to make sure that your website has a, a user-friendly navigation, mobile-friendly responsiveness, simple and secure URL structures, and a fast page load speed. You will also want to make sure that you've addressed or fixed any issues with uh, broken URLs or URLs that are too long, uh, bad links, robots text or site crawl errors, and visual stability. And once you've addressed any of these technical SEO issues, you'll want to update or add title tags, meta descriptions, uh, canonical tags, and schema markup. Awesome, Olivia. Thank you. And now we are going to bust another myth, which is to publish content first and worry about the technical details later. Again, too many people race to publish their content without com considering the details behind the scenes. So as we've just covered, more and more technical details actually matter, and you have to fix those first. Experts are saying that if you fix those first, when you publish that content, it's going to do a lot better. It's going to perform better. So before you build the actual content pieces of your strategy, you really do want to pay attention to and fix these issues. So the myth that the content needs to publish first is busted. Google is, again, putting more focus on site health and performance. So optimizing your content actually starts before you even publish your content. So um, we are gonna, we've covered the technical aspects that need to be optimized, but let's 
get a little bit further into the primary ranking factors. So I'm going to send it back to Olivia to talk us through what are the biggest ranking factors, Olivia? Yeah, so let's review the primary ranking factors that have to be considered when planning and optimizing your content strategy. The goal of search engines is to provide users with the most relevant answers or information based on their search. So optimizing content for search engines will help drive both search engine result page rankings and visibility, uh, which can help your chances of appearing in a SERP and a SERP feature. Great. So as we reviewed, there are more and more ranking factors, but you can look at them as four primary categories. We talked about page experience in the technical section. We'll be covering content in the next section. So now we're going to focus for a minute on relevance and authority, two factors that play different roles. Relevancy uh, is relevancy between the search query and the content on a page. Search engines assess it by uh, various factors like topics or keywords. And then there's authority. Authority is measured by a website's popularity on the, on the internet. So Google assumes the more popular pages, uh, the more valuable the content is to the reader. This will take place by utilizing linking or keeping a and or keeping a low spam report. The more relevance and authority your page has, the more likely that you will rank high in a SERP and maybe even grab that SERP feature. Okay, Olivia, you mentioned SERP feature and I just wanna make sure people understand that. So can you give us a brief overview of what SERP features are? Yeah, of course. A SERP feature appears at the top of a search engine result page. The earliest and most common features were map packs and images, but now you'll see more and more options that show up and highlight uh, specific bits of information that Google thinks that users will find valuable. Featured snippets are a primary component of SERP features. They are concise bits of data that uh, can answer a user's question more easily than clicking on the, the link. So getting your own content to rank in a featured snippet can huge lend or can lend huge uh, site authority. Awesome. So we can sum that up by saying your SEO strategy has to focus on a great user experience, but it also has to provide relevant and authoritative content. Google feels confident showing its users. So to create content that converts, you have to look at all of these things together. And when you do that, again, you're more likely to rank in a SERP feature. And those are growing by the year. You're going to see more and more of them as time goes on. All right. So we have covered the biggest behind the scenes optimization factors on the technical aspects. What are the ranking things? Now we're finally going to dive into what actually makes that great content strategy. So before we do that, I am going to jump in and bust another myth, which is that duplicate content helps you rank for keywords. The more pages, the better. This is absolutely not true, even though it used to be a very common practice. So people who were early adapters of content marketing were really flooding their sites with lots of content. And that did used to help them rank because it just kind of was throwing content out there and seeing what, what would stick, right? Now, though, this can actually hurt you. And this is a big deal. You don't want to have duplicate content. You don't want to have too many pages with similar topics because it's going to divert your attention and, and ultimately hurt you. So this myth is busted. And this is a really important one because more too many people are still thinking in this way. And we really, really have to shift that thinking. So Stephen's going to take us through what it means to build a strong content strategy. And then we'll dive further into how to optimize that content. So Stephen, take it away. So the four core steps for building a content strategy allow you to utilize content that you may already have, as well as give you a chance to develop newer, more updated content. Step one is to audit the content that you already have. Step two is to cut out any of the content that doesn't serve a purpose. Step three is to identify opportunities to reuse or refresh existing pages and articles. And step four is to create your, your new content strategy that utilizes pillar pages and topic clusters. Before you plan a new content strategy, a good place to start is doing a content audit that pulls in the analytics to tell you how your existing content is already performing. In HubSpot, you can pull a report with customized columns that let you view and sort by whatever data you want. In this example, we looked at blogs for a client sorted by top views and included a few more helpful analytics. You can also use keyword analysis tools through Google directly or through a more robust app like Moz to sort by ranking keywords. This will give you this will help you later by giving you a jump start in building out keyword lists. 
So basically, guys, there are a lot of options on what to include in a content audit. And I want to jump in and make sure you don't get too lost in this part because it can be really robust. But let's focus on what you absolutely should or you really have to include to make it work. So you want to include the page title, a brief description of what that content is, especially any notes on like keywords or topics specifically that you're covering, word count, URL, date published, bounce rate, conversions total views in the last year and a section for notes in case you want to add, um, you know, in internal notes on overall quality or things that need to be updated. Total views in the last year is important because even if you had a blog from 10 years ago that used to perform well, if you do total views of all time, it might skew your approach to looking at what's actually working now. So it, it's really important to kind of separate that data. But you might also want to add further for our fields for this, which keywords that are ranking, the CTAs you're using, so you can really specifically link them to what's working and what's not, readability score, internal links, incoming or backlinks, page load speed. There's lots of metrics you can use, so you really can tailor it to your needs and what you plan on approaching first, but these are really the basics. So um, you can get more info and there's a free content audit template at the link on this slide, which we're going to put in the chat for you also. So at HubSpot, you go to this blog, there's going to be a download for a free content template audit out there. And or you can reach out to a digital marketing, excuse me, digital marketing agency like ours. We also have templates that we can help people use. Um, so back to Stephen, what's our next step? So this is where you can look at your content with a bit more eye and check the data to help guide your next steps. Pages that are ranking low and performing badly can really be hurting your website's performance. Part of optimizing your content involves removing any of it that's dragging you down. If you have pages that have been on your site for a while and are still performing poorly, it's time to either remove the content completely or think of a way to refresh or repurpose it. It used to be a to just flood your website with content, even using the same keywords repeatedly on multiple pages. And to be clear, this is the exact opposite of what you should be doing. You should be focusing on the quality of your content much more than the quantity. If you know that you currently have multiple existing pages that cover similar topics, you really need to consider one, building out longer, more robust pages with all related topics on one page, and two, grouping related subtopics into topic clusters. Okay, so that's all true. What does it all mean and why do we do this though? Because Google prefers robust pages. So Google prefers pages with more copy rather than short form pieces that require a user to click all over the site to get a complete answer, right? So pillar pages and topic clusters are the way of the future and you have to get with it. The average word count of top ranking content pieces on Google is slightly above 2000 words. You'll hurt yourself with duplicate content, as we said before. So combining solves that issue. Refreshing content is also very effective and helps your content appear more relevant. HubSpot does offer a really good tool that you can use for building out topic clusters. So this is a little visual example of that. And this is just one way you can do that. At the end of the day, what's the one thing we have to remember, Stephen? It's so important that you always write for the searcher and consider the questions that your audience has around the specific core topic. This will help you out immensely when you're identifying subtopics. So first, you need to identify your core topic. Next, you can build out relevant subtopics. And finally, you can do your keyword research. Yes, topic clusters uh, provide a great rough outline of keyword lists so that you can start looking at opportunities. Don't skimp out on this. Look at for relevant, valuable keywords, preferably with the sweet spot balance of high volume and a low difficulty. And if possible, try to find something with a high organic click-through rate. Keywords can also uh, do the reverse and help guide content topics for the future. So finally, like we mentioned before, always remember to write for your reader. Always base the overall structure and flow of the content on offering a positive user experience. Awesome, thank you, Olivia. So we're gonna assume by this point, we're gonna fast forward and say, now you've grouped your content into relevant clusters, you've got your keywords written into an outline, the content's now been written, it's readable, conversational, and ready to be published. What now? 
Now we're going to get into those final secrets of content optimization that you need to include in your strategy to pull it all together. So we covered the technical part, which lays that foundation. Then we got into how you build that content strategy, which is really important, but we can't stop there. On page optimization efforts are full of ranking signals. People kind of stop at thinking it's one or two things, but really there are sometimes over 200 ranking signals that can affect where a, pa where a page lands in a SERP. So, for example, I want you to keep in mind a lot of ranking signals aren't going to be directly related to SEO ranking. There'll be things that draw the user in, which in turn will convey value. So, for example, a meta description doesn't directly impact search. It's not keyworded, but it does help people understand what the content's about. So if it gets more people to click, that's going to help your ranking over time because, again, that's going to lend itself to the site authority as you get more and more people reading that content on your site. So structure and tag your content appropriately. Be intentional and thorough when you're choosing your title or title tag, your URL, H1, H2s and H3s. Again, make sure you're not trying to just stuff H2s and H3s with keywords. You actually have to make sure that fits the content and it tells the reader what your content is about. You want to make sure you're using alt text and meta description, summary text, and you got to pay attention to the formatting of the page too. So this is talking about the overall layout, right? You want to make sure you're adding white space. You want to break up that text and write for the skimmers because more than 60% of readers are considered skimmers now. They're not reading every word like, they're, like you would read a novel. They're skimming that text to see what stands out to them. And you kind of have to help make things stand out. So looking at making sure you're providing enough space between lines, but not just that, you have to also add visuals wherever you can. So blogs used to look like short stories with a few paragraphs and maybe a picture or two. Now you really want to include featured snippets in your page. That helps Google pull it, right? Um, lists, bullet points. You want to highlight features. You can use sidebars. It has to be a very good experience overall, but it also has to make sense. So looking at all of these things together, you want to you avoid clutter. Let me point that out because we're not saying add all of these things on, on every blog, but you want to look at what the overall purpose and the overall meaning is and what users are going to get away from it. So people reading, your, reading this page on your site, it, they need to be able to read it easily, digest it easily, skim it easily, and get some key takeaways kind of at a glance. Google likes robust content, but it can't be, you know, cluttered or overly sort of lengthened. So break up your text with visuals. Infographics are great. You want to use, you know, visuals as much as possible to explain things. And when you add relevant keyworded alt text to the images and the media on your page, it is magical. It pulls it all together and it helps you even more in those SEO rankings. So make sure your tags are relevant with appropriate keywords attached. And then we want to look at rich media because Google loves pages with rich media content more and more because people love rich media, right? People love video content. They love GIFs. They love audio streams. Including these kind of elements will help your ranking also, but the biggest thing here is to caution you not to overload your site or slow down your page load speeds. So you have to make sure those files are uploaded appropriately, compressed, or your content embedded so as not to slow down those page load speeds. So the overall experience has to be good. Having this media on there is great you still have to make sure that the technical side is working. So you want to work with your IT or your webmaster um, or your digital marketing agency to make sure it's all working appropriately when you add this kind of content. And then we also want to look at checking for accuracy and consistency. This may seem obvious, but this is something too many people kind of fail to check, right? So you want to make sure your basic data is accurate and consistent across your site. So for example, if you live at, if your um, office is at one, two, three main street, if you're spelling out the word street on some pages and you're using ST abbreviation on other pages, that doesn't look consistent. So they're very minor things to look for, but Little details like that can matter. And especially with like map packs and things, if you want to rank in a local map pack in a SERP, you have to make sure that the phone number, the email address used for contact, the 
physical address used and any other key details about your business are consistent on every page. Then you want to make sure that any claims you're making are backed up, any links are valid. You know, we already talked a little bit about minimizing spam links, but if you have content where you're linking to other sources, making sure it's valid, making sure those links are, you know, still working, making sure that anything on your site again is relevant and has that authority aspect because Google wants to send people to sites that they can trust. So Olivia is going to get into a little bit more, though, about the link strategies and what that all means. Yes, the last step in your SEO strategy will be links. You want to address any technical SEO issues and remove bad content first, then focus on building out your internal linking. The right internal links help Google learn uh, about your page by the relevance, the relationship to other pages, and the value of that page. Finally, you can work on your backlink strategy. Now, your backlink strategy, uh, backlinks which are um, which have a big role in site authority are references from your content from other websites. So when another website mentions and points their readers to your content, you gain a backlink to your site. Google uses quantity and quality of these links uh, to signal your website's authority. Quality factors include popularity of the linking site, the topic relevance, and trust in the domain. Awesome, Olivia. And that brings me to SEO myth number five, which is it used to be a common thing to tell people not to include links to outside sources. So it used to be said, hey, why would you include a link to another page? You're going to send your visitor away if you link to outside sources. That has since been busted because Google is looking at real authority here. So if you're writing about a topic and there's another very respected source that can provide more information to either expand on or back up your claims, it is a good thing to link to it. It just shows your user that you're really doing your research and you're providing more and more ways for them to get their answers. And it just gives you site authority so that you're going to get more people coming to your site and trusting your site, Google's going to reward you if you are doing the right thing by saying, hey, we have a lot of information on this, but here are some other experts that might help this Google searcher find what they need, right? So people used to say, don't you, you know, don't divert attention, oops, I went the wrong way, <laughs> from your own site or drive traffic elsewhere. But again, you got to look at it differently now because things have changed and Google is going to ultimately reward you for giving people helpful links to outside sources, and it's going to play into other people giving you backlinks. So we want to talk a little bit about how backlinks work. So we're going to give just a very simple example, but let's say you own a business and you sell, you know, custom frying pans and you write a blog called how to make an omelet. You might get backlinks from different people, like a food blogger who is writing about great ways to cook with eggs. And they're like, oh, this is the pan I use. I'm going to link to that. Or there's a free range egg farm who has a blog about why free range eggs are great and how you can benefit from it. And oh, look, here's the pan we use to make our eggs. So if you get backlinks from outside sources like this, those customers are going to come to your site and go, oh, hey, maybe I'll buy this pan. You're going to get sales from people coming to your site that you weren't directly reaching out to, but these other places are providing, are, are putting trust in you and, and lending trust with their website visitors. So voila, that is kind of how backlinks work in a nutshell, although it is a very big topic of its own. So that's for another day. However, this is just a very small look at kind of how to view different ways of, of using backlinks and also reaching out for backlinks. Oops, went too far. A strong content strategy is interconnected. So not just within your site and not just within the different aspects of your site. So interconnected can mean, yep, technical aspects and content and optimization efforts are all connected together. But also we want to talk about outside of Google. Google is not the only thing that matters. So SEO myth number six is that you only need traffic from Google to be successful. Too many people are going, well, Google is the world's biggest search engine, so that's all that matters. Not really, because Google is also looking at how you rank on other sites and search engines, but also, did you know YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world? Video content is bigger than ever, right? So trying to just optimize a blog or a written post for Google is really limiting what you can do. So this myth is really busted. And Stephen is going to talk a little bit about some of the ways we can optimize our content 
by using multiple platforms. Yes, yeah, so it's always a great idea to repurpose your content for many different mediums. For example, by starting out with video, you can turn the audio of that video into a podcast, you can use the transcript to make a blog, and you can use any clips for your social media channels. You can then link them all together as well as use similar keywords and tags in, this, in the descriptions. When repurposing your content for different mediums, it's crucial to remember to make changes to the content so that it makes sense for the platform and its audience. For example, you can't just take the transcript of a video and turn it into a blog. Instead, you'll want to use any key topics and ideas from the video to create a structure for your blog. Tailoring the content to fit the different platforms helps with engagement, which then helps build trust and authority. And of course, that's a big factor in, optimi in optimizing your overall SEO. All right, so that really is, in a nutshell, the biggest different factors to know about optimizing your content on your own site and across the web. But that's not all. So for a long-term strategy to succeed, you have to plan to continually analyze your efforts and then make more changes as needed and regularly refresh your content to keep it relevant. So this is our final myth that we're gonna bust today which is once you publish content, you can set it and forget it. And that is so not true anymore. This is how we got into the mess of people having way too much content, outdated, sitting on their site. This myth is busted. We've talked about why we need to consolidate content and remove old content or irrelevant content. It's more important than ever. Just like Rome, great SEO is not built in a day. It's a continuous effort to use the latest SEO trends, tactics and strategies to boost your Google rankings and stay ahead of your competitors. So Olivia, you are a big fan of analytics and I just want you to tell us why they're so important. I am a big fan of analytics and that's because continuous optimization helps to ensure that you stay at the top of the search engine rankings even when old practices stop working. So monitoring SEO performance through analytics is really essential to optimizing your strategy. To do this, we recommend using HubSpot's SEO tools, such as the traffic analytics and the page performance. In addition to monitoring your analytics, we also recommend keeping up with industry trends and upcoming Google updates. Awesome, thank you. So really the message there is guys, things are gonna continue changing. You have to pay attention to the analytics on your site to see how they're responding to the changes, right? So looking at your analytics over time, and using sites or tools where they can tell you, okay, this is when a, an algorithm change happened and oh, look, my site changed in ranking. Tying it all together and being able to analyze what works and what doesn't is really, really important. So we are gonna cover the top 10 key takeaways from today's presentation. Systems are always changing. So it's important that you stay ready to adapt. Fix and optimize the technical aspects of your site before focusing on content. And always focus on the user experience. Do a content audit. Remember, it's quality over quantity. You want to build your strategy around topic clusters and pillar pages. Follow on-page optimization tips and best practices. Build a link strategy. Embrace cross-channel content. And always continue to monitor and adapt. Awesome. Thanks, guys. And there you have it. That's the biggest takeaways from today, summing up what we went through at kind of lightning speed. So we know we covered a lot of information today. Um, we also want to make sure we're opening up that Q&A session. And I'm going to give the host duties over to Angie. Thanks, Jennifer. Well, I hope everyone really enjoyed the presentation. Any questions you've got, if you want to enter them in the pane to your right, there is a Q&A section right under that chat feature. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. I'll give it just a minute so you have a moment to process any questions you might have. while we're waiting i want to thank everybody who joined us today it's always great to geek out about some of our favorite topics and kind of share our knowledge we certainly love that oh great we've got a question from lisa she is asking about visual stability can you explain that further jennifer 
Yeah. So that's going to have a lot of different factors in it. It's going to have, so let me get back into, we're talking about the cumulative layout shift, which was part of that core uh, core vitals update that rolled out this year. And it's basically looking at improving the web design, the experience. Um, it's looking at making sure the the load speed time is good. You want to make sure that things are rendering appropriately. Um, it, there's a lot of components to it, but it really is, again, back to that page experience. So most of it is load page speed, but it's also going to be the responsiveness. So responsive design, making sure that you aren't, um, you know, looking really wonky on smaller screens, which most people have corrected by now. But if you have sort of an older site, you it may be harder to um, make things responsive. So you're going to see things where on older sites, they may have rich media that takes forever to load, but it also isn't displaying the way you really want it to. And that's the kind of stuff you want to look out for. So having your digital marketing agency or your webmaster look at the, the loading time of some of those rich media or other um, images, things like that, but making sure that the layout looks good. Um, if you're opening it on a phone or a tablet and it's not displaying correctly, that is a big signal factor that you're not kind of following these core web vitals updates. Um, so that's a big part of it. Uh, and again, that's a, a big topic because there are so many of these little pieces that come into it. So that's something where if you're, I, I'm going to say this though, if you look at a site and it just doesn't look right, that's, <laughs> that's the biggest signaling factor. You may not know what's causing it not to look right, but if you go to your site, either on your computer screen or on your tablet or on your phone, and you go, ooh, that's just not looking right. That's the number one thing, right? So it may not be something you can diagnose. You're going to want to reach out to, um, again, digital agency, or if you have a webmaster that handles your site, you want to get them involved and say, what's going on here? It just doesn't look right, frankly. So, Thanks, Jennifer. We've got another question from Rose. SERP features, what exactly is this? Is it similar to a Google-sponsored ad that appears at the top of Google search? Olivia, do you want to take this one? I do, yes. Rose, that's a great question. Uh, a SERP feature is free uh, versus Google ads, which you have to pay for. Uh, they're a little bit different as well. Uh, if you were to go on your phone right now and ask uh, Google a simple question, you would see uh, potentially a, a listing for a local business, maybe a drop-down menu with some other answers, some frequently asked questions similar to yours. That is a SERP feature. It's a, a concise way to uh, translate that information to the, the user without them having to click on another page. So it'll look different than a, um, uh, a normal Google listing, whereas a Google ad, a Google search ad, will look almost identical to a listing. And also it's important to say that different types of searches are gonna have different types of features. So if you are looking, for example, to purchase something and it's very clearly something that you are looking to purchase locally, they're gonna have the local map, pack, map, I have a hard time, map packs is what they're called. A local map pack is gonna offer up some local businesses that Google trusts that they know is offering the product that or product or service that you're looking for um, so that you can easily get directions to that business. Um, if you're looking for, you know, shopping results, we've all seen the shopping banners go across. So that's part of that. But there's also, you know, images are pretty popular, but you're going to see more and more of these roll out. There are almost 20 different types of SERP features now. So, and I think they're just going to continue to expand based on the data we see as they just, you know, Google is continually looking at what to offer, what to make it um, more user-friendly and, and sort of what's drawing people in. So SERP features can have a lot of different graphs or another thing. If you're looking up specific data, um, like if you're looking up statistics, you're going to start seeing more actual graphs show up. And that's a kind of a newer feature. So Things like that, keep an eye out for them because you're going to see more and more of them. Thanks, Jennifer and Olivia. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? We do have a couple more minutes, so happy to stick around and answer any questions that everyone might have. Uh, we will be sending out the entire presentation and a link to the recording after this in case you guys want to go back and redigest some of this complicated content, uh, which would be totally understandable. I'm going to ask a question of, um, since if, I don't know, Angie, if we don't have any other questions waiting, I'm just going to put out there, if anybody wants to weigh in on what they'd like to see in, a, in our next hug, because we are still deciding internally 
what to cover. And there were a lot of topics today, for example, that uh, we could have entire presentations about because we covered so many topics. So if anybody has an opinion or a, a thought on what we should dive into more for the next hug, we'd certainly love to hear that as well. Yeah, if, ever, if anybody does have an idea or wants to know about some topic related to digital marketing and or HubSpot anything, please put it in the chat and we will take that into consideration as we plan our next hug. But we do have a question from Howard. Will backlinks from video hosting websites like YouTube rank similarly to standard websites or will Google have an algorithm to account for that? Uh, I'm actually going to give this one to you, Jennifer. I think you, you know most about that. All right, I'm trying to... Can you see the question one more time, Angie? Sure. Will backlinks from video hosting websites like YouTube rank similarly to standard websites or will Google have an algorithm to account for that? Okay. Uh, I don't know that Google has a specific algorithm for video ranking sites, but I do, from everything I do know, um, YouTube is a, a pretty credible site. So Google is looking at that as... Um, if it's a backlink from, so I want to back up. So if it's somebody's own, if you have your own account on YouTube and you're linking to your own content, that's a little different than if a page itself. So I think that's what you're at. So it's not necessarily from YouTube as a source. If you're linking to yourself from your own uh, YouTube profile, it can, it can certainly help, but it's not going to it's not going to really be considered a true backlink because it's, you know, Google can detect that it is sort of you linking to you, but it does help. So that's part of that sort of omni-channel expansion that helps overall. So I can't speak to the specific algorithms around how Google detects that, but it is something that they can detect. So if it's, again, if it's other people on YouTube though, um, if anybody else on YouTube is linking to your site, that's a true backlink. So that's the kind of stuff that they, they certainly can detect, but it does all help. It's just to, to a different degree, if that makes sense. All right, next question from Camila. Uh, are banner adverts and high traffic websites considered backlinks? They are not. Uh, that would be uh, paid, uh, paid search traffic. So that's how that would be right in your analytics. Great question. And then we have another one from Corey. Do you have any suggestions about consolidating current content into topic clusters? Do we have a volunteer to answer? Yeah. yeah. So uh, again, this is where you would want, want to start with that content audit because it's going to depend on how much content you already have. Um, if you have a really, really robust amount, I, I mean, if, you, if you've been doing content for a while and you have just tons of pages and blogs, um, you really need to look at that critically. Um, if you haven't been, been producing content for that long, it's, it's really going to change how you approach it. But what, what the overall uh, overarching advice here is that if you have content that's older than a year, for example, you definitely want to start looking at what to do with it because um, it really hasn't been that long that topic clusters and pillar pages have sort of taken over. So my guess is that older content is that shorter form, traditional blog style. Um, a lot of times people were going, oh, I want five blogs a month because I want to have as much content as possible because that's going to help me rank. Now you sort of have to look at it on the opposite and really engage with, if I have five different blogs that are on related topics, that's where you want to start combining them into those clusters. So whatever the overarching topic is, that's the, the page topic. And then if you have different... Um, blogs that would sort of support that topic, start pulling those together. And if it's something you're not familiar with, I would I would recommend kind of working with um, your digital marketing agency to kind of have them walk you through it because it can get really involved. It can be really time consuming, but it is going to set you up for much more success and better traffic going forward. So really looking at, and again, Angie, did you put the, the link in the, um, the yep. chat? That's a, that's a good place to start. It's very informative. Um, but yeah, it, it's going to depend a lot on what kind of content you have out there, how long it's been out there, how it's already performing, um, and sort of what your business is and what kind of topics you're covering. So well, I'm going to bring up Olivia's favorite word, analytics. Uh, I think it's also really important to be looking at how your content's performing. So if you have a whole host of blogs that are all on the same topic and one of them is performing really well, 
that's your opportunity to take that one and refresh it and maybe pull in some of the other blogs content to make that blog that's performing well even better. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got another question from Rose. Uh, other sites that have um, backlinks to your own site, how do you decide if it is valuable or not? Olivia, it looks like you wanted to jump in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Rose, that's a great question. Uh, so if you're using SEMrush uh, or another platform like Moz, uh, you'll have things uh, like spam reports. Um, so the spam rating will give you a good indication on whether or not it's a trustworthy site. Uh, higher the report, higher the score the less secure it is. So you wanna stick with something that is under 3%. Um, you can always dispute those links to get rid of them through SEMrush. Uh, so that's a great program to be using for your backlinks. Uh, but that would be the best thing to look for is the spam report and then look at the page and site authority. Those three analytics should give you a good indication on whether or not that's a, a good backlink. Correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't Google have free tools as well that kind of allow you to assess, assess whether or not um, a backlink is spammy? And I know Google for sure allows you to disavow links that you don't want linking to your content. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you'll definitely want to set your website up on Search Council. Uh, that will give you a good indication of uh, who's actively linking to you um, and where they are coming from. Lisa's got another question. Do toxic links hurt your site? Yes. <laughs> Short answer is yes. But I know Olivia also loves to answer this one. So <laughs> uh, um, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, toxic links absolutely hurt your site. You'll want to get rid of those and address those as soon as possible. It's going to hurt more if you're linking intentionally to a bad site than if somebody else is linking to you because you can dispute somebody else linking to you and you can block that. But if you are actively sending people to a bad site, that's absolutely uh, a terrible practice and cut it out. <laughs> yep, you'll always want to link to sites that have a high domain authority. Uh, the higher the authority of the linking site, the, uh, the more trust you'll get from. Quantity also matters. I feel like we have to say that. If you've only got one toxic link, that's not going to hurt you the same way 20 toxic links would. Right. And also, actually, since you brought up quantity, um, trying to include too many links on a single page is another signaling factor. So even if you have like, if you have 40 links on a blog, just trying to put stuff out there, it's, it's, it's too much. So you want to make sure it's relevant and, and it matters. So even if it's not technically a toxic link, trying to overuse links is kind of like keyword stuffing link stuffing is also not great. We've got another question from Howard. For technical companies with lots of content, will content libraries be an effective method to manage content, or should we try to group the content into content clusters? Yeah, so it again, as long as you're not having too much repetitive or duplicate content. So if you have a lot of different, if you truly have a lot of different categories, a library of those topics is absolutely a, a good practice. So for example, like the Mayo Clinic has a lot of content. And if you look up um, some, you know, a medical term of some sort that is related to other things, you'll, you'll notice more and more that their pages are getting longer, but obviously they have a lot of content. So they also now have more of that, um, the, the topic or the, the libraries as far as the medical terms, but um still kind of combining related terms and things like that that's probably a bad example because that falls into that ymyl there's a different practice for health and i don't know why that popped into my head but i was trying to think of a really robust site that has a lot of different content and that is sort of how that's looked at so if you have a site where you have just a, a truly a lot of different categories absolutely you don't want to combine topics that aren't relevant um so it, it's just making sure that you don't have 10 different content pieces that are pretty similar. So it might be, you know, a lot of this is kind of a judgment call, um, but also this is where you can pull some of those key, keyword ranking reports, right? So if you pull a keyword ranking report for your existing content, that helps you also see how similar some of these keywords and topics are. So if you do have multiple content pieces and you're thinking maybe they're not too similar, but you pull a keyword report and it's like, well, these are very similar, 
you might want to revisit either how the content is structured or laid out uh, or, you know, or how you're separating or combining things. That's, that's going to play a role too. So again, you want to, you want to combine content where it makes sense to do so. You want to absolutely make sure that you're clustering those topics when they truly are relatable to each other. Um, but if you have a lot of different categories, then they certainly can stay separate. Yeah, and I just want to say that uh, it's not an uh, if uh, or. You can always do both. Uh, you can always have a, a knowledge base or a library with all of your content um, that's readily available. And if there are uh, you know specific clusters that you could have, uh, break those out into pillar pages. Those will uh, do really well with uh, keywords, and it's a great way to do some uh, internal linking uh, to your website. So. Pillar pages are a great strategy and they don't have to be one or the other. We've got another question from Rose. How do you find out if a website or page has high domain or page authority? Okay. Um, oh, Olivia, sorry. It looked like you. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I didn't want to step on your desk. So um, that's uh, an analog you can find through several different sources. Um, I think, is this the same person that was using SEMrush? I believe so. There. Through SEMrush, through Moz, there are certainly reports you can pull um, looking at a root domain to see overall um, domain authority. And then you can also enter individual page links to see how that ranks. Those are a little bit more, you know, they fluctuate more because the overall domain authority is really going to give you that overall view of how, how Google views your site. So, for example, if you have a very low domain authority, you're much less likely to rank highly for an individual page, even if it is very authoritative and, and well done. So likewise, you're less likely to rank very low on a page if you have a high domain authority. So there's some give and take there. But yeah, you can get that kind of reporting through SEMrush, through Moz. Um, and then that also factors into how you do your keyword research. So you can actually, there's, there's ways you can calculate sort of what, what kind of difficulty you can expect to gain if you're going after keywords um, and they have difficulty rankings. You can first calculate sort of where your page ranks and what you can expect to then go after. Um, if you are sort of on the climb and you're like, uh, you know, you're kind of mediocre, then you're not going to want to go after those really, really hard keywords at first. You're going to want to go for some of the lower ranking ones that are more feasible as you build that authority. Great questions. Do, do we have any additional questions? Oh. Uh, yep, we are also looking forward to in-person again. This, this has its time and its place, but uh, I think we're all ready to shake hands and interact with each other again. <laughs> all right, well, uh, do we wanna move on to the next slide? Oh, yes, we do. Sorry, I forgot I had control over that. Here we go. Uh, I would be remiss without mentioning our next hug date, save the date, Tuesday, December 7th, 2021 at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we don't have the topic yet. That's why if there's something you guys are really interested in learning about, we are so happy to cover it. Uh, if not, we'll pick an interesting topic and hope you join us. Uh, always, you can go to events.hubspot.com backslash Lansing and check out what events are coming up and to register for them. Thanks so much. I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation. It's been an absolute pleasure and we hope to see you at the next one.